Mauri oho, mauri tu, mauri ora ki a tātou. Haumi e, hui e, tāi ki e. Uh, kia ora e te whānau, ki Tausig. Nau mai, hāri mai, ki tēnei hui. Ko Ngāti Pākehā te iwi, ko Otaki te haukainga, ko Marisa King tōku ingoa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome everyone to our second Telsig webinar for this week. Uh, my name is Marisa and I am the new uh, co-convener of Telsig along with Natalie Smith who, who is with us. And we also have Ivy Guo with us who has uh, been a, an important part of our team. And together with a, a committee of, of uh, friendly people, we are here to get Telsig back on the map. So uh, I, I'm really pleased to see you all here tonight and to have three um, really interesting presentations coming up for you. Before we kick into the presentations, I would like to welcome along Anna Pickering, who is the Executive Director of Lianza, who is going to say a few words to us from Lianza before we kick off. So welcome, Anna. Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I wasn't able to attend last night, so um, Helen Heath, who's our comms advisor, um, did all the live tweeting, and now the responsibility of it is mine tonight, so I'm hoping I can keep up with her very high standards. Uh, I just wanted to say, um, uh, firstly, thank you to the three speakers who are um, reprising their conference um, presentations. It's a really wonderful way to share it a little bit further. and. Um, Hopefully we are videoing and, and we'll be able to put that up for people to um, look at later because there were quite a few questions on Twitter um, asking whether or not um, the presentations would be recorded. Um, and I just wanted to say really special thanks to um, the people who are getting TELSEG up and running again. We had a quick catch up at Victoria University uh, earlier this week and uh, discussed a few a few ideas and um, one of the things that we really focused on after the conference um, going forward is strengthening the the, um, the support and delivery to tertiary librarians from, from Lianza. And so we'll be coming out through Telsig to ask uh, you for your um, input in, into such things as how can we have a much more diverse and rich content for tertiary librarians at the next Lianza conference. So I really hope to use um, use the SIG and, and use the leadership being provided by the SIG to connect with you more effectively so that Lanza can be supporting your work um, out there much better. Um, I think that's all I needed to say and otherwise I'm going to be tweeting. Thank you so much, Anna. I'd like to um, just take this opportunity to acknowledge you and the Lianza um, team in the office for, for all of the help that you have given us to get things underway and get the word out there that Telsig is back. Much appreciated. So we will now kick into our first presentation for the evening and we are going to hear from Joe Simons for the from the University of Auckland. So before I invite Joe to speak I'll just quickly run through for you how things are going to run tonight. So each speaker will have uh, 15 minutes to speak and then there will be five minutes for questions after each presentation. And then at the end, we've allocated um, some more question time if there are more things that people want to ask or discussion uh, you want to have. So if you need to leave early for any reason, I mean, obviously we'd love you to stay for the whole presentation, but if you need to, um, leave early, that's that's not a problem. So with that, I will welcome uh, Jo Simons from the University of Auckland to talk to us about her topic, Having a Look-See, Evidence-Based Practice by Stealth. Welcome Jo. Kia ora koutou. Um, thanks and welcome for inviting me along to, to, to talk a bit about the presentation that I um, gave for Lianza. So I've cut this one down from a bigger um, presentation, so apologies if it's a little bit clunky um, and jumps around a little bit at times. Um, as part of my presentation, I had some polls, online polls, and so I'm going to 
paste those into the chat box. And so if you want to have a go at filling in the polls, you don't have to, but it's just a couple of little questions around the first ones, um, if people are actually doing evidence-based practice, um, and then the other ones, a question about which of these different things do you consider to be evidence? So if you want to have a go, um, we can have a, a look at the end and see um, if we have time and see what the results look like from the, the people who are here. But I will share my slides. Get, get us going. So, um, as you heard, I'm based at the University of Auckland, but I actually gave this presentation with my research SIG hat on, because we're about um, supporting practitioner research and getting people to do more of it, um, and then talking about the research and providing ways to um, support that as much as we can. So, flying rigour under the radar. So, what actually is evidence-based practice in libraries? So Booth defined it as evidence-based librarianship being an approach to information science that promotes the collection, interpretation, and integration of valid, important, and applicable user-reported, librarian-observed, and research-derived evidence. And so that's kind of a complicated um, definition and there's a very much a concept of evidence-based practice being something that's very formal um, for creating work that can then be published in academic journals. And we're trying to encourage the idea that it doesn't really have to be. Um, as you can see from the source, um, evidence-based practice was something that did originate in the health professions. Um, and in those contexts, it is a very structured system. But we think then um, that librarians can and do use it in a day-to-day -day basis as part of their practice. So what are we doing in New Zealand around evidence-based practice? There's actually very little in the um, published um, literature about evidence-based practice in New Zealand. But that doesn't mean that there isn't any being done but there's just very little that's been published about there out there that we're putting out there. There have been professional discussions on evidence-based librarianship in New Zealand for over 20 years, but it's just almost impossible to find official reports of its use in practice um, using a formal approach. But what is evidence then? Um, and that's where the second poll comes in. Um, the only difference between information and evidence is that evidence is being used to prove or disprove a theory or hypothesis. So your theory might be that, for example, a uh, weeding policy isn't going to provide the right sort of um, collection that's going to support your communities. And so it might be that they're being asked to remove everything that's over 10 years old in the business section, but you think that people are using the collection differently, that some of those old resources. So that's your theory. Um, and then how are you going to prove it? And how are you going to use that to influence decisions? So what is the belief that you're challenging? What's the new idea that you think is true or will work? So it's not just about getting information for the sake of knowing about it. And so there's a paper that was put out um, by Gillespie et al. They did a um, study um, qualitatively interviewing a wide range of librarians in um, Australia. Um, and have what sort of information and what sorts of evidence they use to inform their decision making processes. And it's a really wide and broader than what you might initially expect counts as evidence. So everything from observation, whether it was deliberate and controlled or unexpected and serendipitous, you saw someone doing something randomly and wrote it down, um, feedback, whether it was formal like a survey or incidental encounters like emails from patrons, 
um, sharing experiences and informal networking with professional colleague, um, colleagues, such as at conferences or just when you meet up with them, um, actually using the research literature to, to increase the credibility of the evidence that you're using, um, statistics of a wide range of different type, whether it's internal data for accountability, plotting trends, thinking about workload, um, or even intuition. Um, your personal experience and knowledge is actually what's um, feeding into your intu intuition, that gut feeling you have about whether something's going to work or not, um, and how you're interpreting the actions of, other, of others. But the big thing about it is context is everything. Not all of these types of evidence are appropriate for um, informing decisions in different contexts. Um, things that um, intuition is going to be perfectly um, valid for informing a decision you're making about the way that you personally work. But when you're trying to convince someone to invest money in something or to change a process, then you need um, a different sort of evidence to take with them. But the big thing is that people are collecting evidence already. Um, talking to my manager um, at an academic library and she said that she'd never done evidence-based practice. But when I talked to her about how she made decisions, she said, well, of course, the first thing any librarian does is have a bit of a look-see to figure out what's going on. And um, you're like, basically, this is literally basing your practice, your everyday work on information that you've gathered to make decisions on. And so, Although you say something's based on intuition, it's really based on things that you've observed, heard, conversations, experiences. And so it's about formalizing this and actually tracking it. So as I said, some evidence has been suited for particular types of audiences and all types of decisions. And so you need to think about using the right evidence and articulating it to support your argument or hypothesis. But given that you're already collecting the new services, the information about new services that we're developing for our, communi our communities, but we don't actually communicate a lot about how the decisions were actually made. So you are already gathering the evidence and it doesn't take a whole lot of tweaking to add a bit of rigor to your evidence collection so that you can use it and share it. Big things, or the most important things to have collected and actually documented are the five W's and the H that come up, come up in all sorts of contexts. But in this case, what is your evidence? What types of evidence are you collecting? Where did it come from? What are the systems or the methods that you're using to pull this information, this evidence together? Why did you collect it? What did this particular piece of evidence or type of evidence, um, what could it tell you about the thing that you're trying to prove or argument you're trying to make? Um, when did you collect it? What time periods does it cover? You keep a running document of evidence, particularly observations, these serendipitous one-off things you need to keep track of um, so you know exactly what happened when. Um, who does your evidence cover? Um, is it a particular group of people who are giving feedback? Or are there particular populations or uh, part of your communities that you're trying to target for services? Um, and then, of course, the big one is how is your evidence actually relevant to the question or hypothesis that you're trying to prove? It? So an example um, we pulled out was, um, say, someone at a public library is doing a mums and babies session. Um, they've been pretty happy with it as a new service, but there's a couple of different ways that you might state the evidence. Giving casual personal evidence like this um, is perfectly fine for giving feedback in a team meeting situation about how it's going, but it's not what you want to give to the people who are actually making the financial decisions on whether to continue the service. Something like this is a lot wordier, but the important bit is it's giving details. Um, 
not too many de details, but it's still summarizing um, what you did, when you did it, what was the result, what data did you collect, how did you collect it. Um, this one, for example, includes three types of evidence, um, the attendance at the sessions, the door counts of people coming into the library, and qualitative feedback from the, from the patrons. And it gives a clearer picture of um, how it's actually worked and, and what impact your service has actually had to the people who are making the decisions. One of the biggest things to think about is documenting as you go when you're collecting evidence of any type. Um, you may think that you'll remember things, but you never do. Um, if you don't keep track of it in a consistent way, you'll lose the data, you'll lose your own confidence in presenting the data, and you'll lose some of the accuracy. So that's getting into that as a habit, um, as part of your working practice, can help a lot. One of the things that um, comes up a bit is the um, discussion around building a better mousetrap. So the example in this is engineers versus marketers. If you give an engineer the problem of building a better mousetrap, they can work forever on coming up with new designs and better ways to do it um, and con continually redefining it. But your marketers will look at the first design that you, get, that you came up with and say, does it work? And if it does, well, why can't we just keep people to use this? Let's just sell it to them instead. And that's a problem that we have in librarianship. In particular, we tend to be perfectionists and um, want to m modify and massage things until they're perfect before we take them to anyone. And we really need to think a bit more about um, getting some GMO in our life. Which is, whoops, good enough, move on. And um, that can be hard, I know. Um, I have trouble with it myself, um, and everyone does, but saying, is this going to do the job, or am I spending too much time on it? There's a lot of examples um, of people who are using evidence-based practice to um, inform what they're doing and the services. Um, you see it in the Lianza presentations, the presentations at RLR1, Slanza, all of our conferences, um, the, the um, different SIGs across the country when they put on their weekends. But it's... Although they talk about it, um, there's less of the um, how. It's a lot more about the stories of um, what's changed and what and the outcomes and the impacts, which is what we're interested in. But thinking about how you made the decision is something that we would like a bit more um, information on. Um, there's some great examples in the National Library around promoting evidence-based practice in school libraries. Um, and I've put a couple of links to some of their topics um, at the end of the slides as well. You don't have to go into very formal evidence-based gathering, like statistics and survey design and thinking about interviews. But you can if you want to, and there's nothing really scary about them. It's basically just numbers and stories. Um, there are a lot of really good resources to help you with this. Um, you need to use them early though, because it's more important to think about how you're going to use them and use them well than to come in at the last minute and scrabble some bits of things together um, and, and try to do statistics or analysis on it. Um, think carefully about how you use it. Regardless of whether you're using very formal evidence-based practice, ethics is a really central part of this, and you need just to ask yourself some hard questions. Why do I know what's going on? Who's given um, permission for their, their words to their data to be used in this? Um, there's significant cultural considerations about the collection and use of certain types of data. Um, have people said that you can show this data to other people? 
um, is the inform all of the information that you're gathering actually going to be used to answer your question? And if it's not, then why are you collecting it? So how does evidence-based practice help? Um, it leads to better decisions. And anecdotally, people are doing a lot of it, particularly um, in academic libraries. Um, you may have seen quite a bit of it yourselves, um, being involved in tertiary libraries. There are often a lot of the projects actually have an evidence section in them. Um, it's fantastic professional development for people. Um, there's, there's skills that are transferable across almost any role um, that you're going to go into. Um, around writing reports, around providing evidence around your decisions. Um, and it's a lot easier to get money um, out of funders if you can provide some strong evidence around the decisions or the um, proposals that you're putting forward. But the big thing that we want to say is please start sharing this with other people. We know you're doing it, but there's nothing out there. And so people are reinventing the re wheel constantly because there's no um, collective knowledge about how we're doing this in New Zealand. It doesn't have to be formal in a journal publication. Um, submit stories to library life. Write something for the Lianza blog. Talk about it at a, at a conference. Um, we'd love to hear more about it. And we are here to help. Um, that is what Research SIG is here for. Um, we've got some, we've built a research toolkit, which is an online resource about these different things. Um, we're available to um, provide mentoring or to um, link you up with a mentor in your region as well if you can't find someone to help out with these sorts of things. I would say, come and talk to us. Now, I think I ran a little bit over time, but how am I going? <laughs> Uh, Joe, that's not a problem at all. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation and particularly your slides. Yeah. They are just beautiful. <laughs> oh, you can thank um, Annie and Claudia for that because I had a lot of help from my um, compatriots in um, the research committee with um, putting the slides together with this. And Claudia actually took some of the lovely photos that are in it as well. Oh, right. Oh, well, that's great. The ones that don't have citations. <laughs> I can see I'm going to have to find out more about this research thing. <laughs> You're obviously um, doing some very good work. I found that a very inspiring presentation and I think it's really important if we want to be taken seriously as a profession that we are engaged with evidence-based practice. And I think demonstrated how just with a, a little bit of effort we can, you know, have, have some evidence for us, particularly for our funders to support the things we're doing and want to do. Yeah. I thank you very, very much for that. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to open it up to questions now. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask Jo? I'll give you a couple of minutes in case you prefer to engage on the chat. Um, I've got a question. It's Anne here. Kia ora, Jo. That was awesome. I'm really pleased I got to see that. Uh, Thank you. Have, you. have you used some evidence-based stuff in your own practice to convince management or others of you know, changing the way they were thinking of doing something? Um, it's pretty much a part of everything that we have to do. Um, if we want to put forward a case for a new service or um, we need to write a business case and put it forward, and so we actually have some formal frameworks around that. Um, so whether it's we do surveys of people, if we're doing some user-based experience, looking at what our people want around service design, um, gathering statistics, we do that quite often around our collections. We're constantly being asked, you're paying for a lot of expensive databases, are people using that? And so it's a combination of looking at things like the usage stats and the hit stats on the databases, the cost per use, but then also talking to the people who are using them and saying, well, even if it looks like it's expensive per use, what are they actually getting out of it? What's the value coming out of it for our um, communities who are using collections? And so there's, we use it quite a lot and um, 
being at a university, they pretty much require that we document and we provide them with various types of evidence before um, they'll approve any of the, the things that we put forward to do. But it doesn't have to be formal like that. Even just a little bit help. Um, as a research SIG, we gave out a couple of grants for people to do research. And so um, we actually, it was quite interesting because it's not something that people get taught how to write an application for some funding. And that can be um, really challenging. It's like, where do you put your evidence? What sorts of things do you want to tell people? And so we're thinking perhaps something that's something else that we might teach to think about building a resource around as well for people. Thanks, Joe. Uh, any other questions? I think um, just in the chat, Nora's made a really good point that um, we, we all do most some type of evidence, but we seldom, you know, put them into writing and actually and actually share it with people. Yeah. And, you know, that's something we could do more of in the tertiary library sector. I think is, is to share more more of our evidence um, with each other. So that might be something we can. Look at yes. And I was thinking about, it's like making it findable as well, because we know that probably people are doing these things, but people are often a bit shy about asking people about it. And so um, it's like, how do we get it out there? It's so making it searchable for a Google search or, or promoting to people that we've put it on a part of our website via the answer or whatever we end up doing with it. Just making it findable as well. You're like, well, search engine optimization is completely, that's another story for another day, but we could do a whole presentation on that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, findability as well. Yes. Because people do care and they are interested. Yes, yes. We can all learn from each other. Mm. Any final questions? This is the final call for questions. <laughs> Okay, well, thank, thanks again, Joe. And, and uh, jo, if you don't mind, just um, if you can just turn off your screen share. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we can uh, move on to our, thank you, we can move on to our next presenter. And so I'd like to welcome Anne Ferrier Watson from the University of Waikato, who's going to talk to us about traditional metrics, old metrics, and researcher profiles faculty perceptions and us. So welcome Anne. Kia ora everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for your lovely welcome um, Anna and thank you Joe and uh, Maurice. Sorry I've written down your names and I've moved my paper. Marisa and Natalie, thanks for all the work that you've done to get this happening. It's actually a survey of faculty perceptions and use but I think the us is quite nice. So um, I will rip into it. Um, Let's make sure I can make my PowerPoint move on. That's good. Right. So I'm talking about research impact, which many of you will know is, you know, the big noise about in academia and the ways that some of that impact can be indicated is through traditional and alternative metrics. Researcher profiles make that work more visible and the idea being the work, the more visible the work, the more chance it has to generate the holy grail of impact. So here's a very short version of impact, which is the traceable influence that a scholarly entity has on other research. However, um, this has been broadened to, to talk about the impact outside of academia, in society, in economy and environment. Um, so these ways, this impact can be measured using traditional metrics, and you'll see there I've mentioned citation counts, H index, journal rankings, yes, and then more, more, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Sharing your screen. Oh, whoopsie, my bad. That's okay. I thought I had, but obviously, well, I had, I'd practiced, and then I managed to stop stop sharing it. No problem. Okay, I'm just needing to go back to the view, and thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. for right. nice. <laughs> more familiar? Okay, you didn't miss much. I was just saying what you can see on the screen. But, um... So traditional metrics have been around since the 1960s. They came out of the library field to try and find ways of determining which journals to buy. And then in the 2000s, 2010 rather, as more and more material is online, 
alternative metrics that didn't necessarily relate to citation counts were, um, were ways of measuring how much an item is reaching things. And very quickly, an example of, of, a met of no citations, this is a piece of research I did in 2010, no, 2015, nobody in Google Scholar has cited it. However, um, you can see that it's been downloaded quite a lot. So that's heartening. So somebody's using it, they're just not, not citing it. So that's an example of alternative metrics in action. Doesn't tell you much without a context. Also, researcher profiles, these are some of them. And um, they're, I'm not going to really go on to what they do, but they f perform a range of functions, and we'll, we'll hear a bit more about that later. So I did this research because um, in my role as academic liaison librarian, I was expected to be going out there and helping people um, develop their profiles, get them all linked up, and to um, find metrics for their work. Um, and I'm the Arts and Humanities Librarian. And I quickly discovered that this stuff didn't really mean much to those people. It, they, their metrics weren't great. It, it, it didn't reflect the value of the work that they did. So um, I thought, well, I want to find out more about this. So I used the, um, the, the mass of information studies as a little Trojan horse to get this information to myself. And what I did was I, oopsie, just go back, oopsie, going back the other way. Um, I surveyed um, at a university that I, that I agreed not to name. I surveyed um, all the academics and I got um, 91 complete responses, or nearly complete, sorry. And you'll see that I got a lot more people from the social sciences than I did from the arts and humanities. Um, which could also be reflected that social sciences is a very large field. I asked people, just having a bit of trouble with it, yep, I asked these questions. What did they produce, where they got metrics, how they understood them, whether they thought there was value in reflecting where they work, um, and also their thoughts about researcher profiles. So it was a really big project and I got stupid amounts of data, but I did answer the question. So I found out that, um, most of the people I surveyed were producing journal articles, and as they're one of the main main sources of formal metrics, that, that meant that I, they could really participate to some extent in this discussion. Um, that others, much fewer, also did other things that aren't mentioned here. Interestingly, Google Scholar is the main place where they go and get their, um, their metrics, as opposed to those you know, fancy, expensive citation databases. Although a lot don't seek them. It's not a surprise they use Google Scholar. It's quick and dirty and it's easy. Um, alternative metrics, again, uh, uh, nearly a quarter didn't use them, but those that did went to ResearchGate. Again, we go back to that. It's quick, it's dirty, they're familiar with it. Um, so um, what I found out when I, so I'm ripping through this because the more interesting stuff is, is to do with the, the qualitative comments, which we'll get to. So I learned out of this that there are really strong disciplinary alignments um, and understandings, and sciences consider that traditional metrics do to some extent reflect the value of their work and that they are important to both promotion and to research assessment. So consequently, because they're important, Sciences have a better understanding and use of them. <coughs> the arts and humanities are inverse. They aren't so important. Therefore, their understandings and use are lower. And the social sciences are somewhere in the middle. Across the board, people understood traditional metrics more than alternative metrics. Excuse me, I'm just going to cough. <coughs> but significantly, nobody considered that traditional metrics were a... Um, extremely accurate representation of the value of their work and around a quarter in each of those disciplines didn't didn't um, didn't know how accurate they were so there's really high levels of non-engagement and the main objection to these metrics was the evaluation gap where the work produced is not measured by those tools and um, this perception of inaccuracy provides some indication as to why respondents do or don't use metrics um, and even though none believe they were highly accurate, they're still using them. And this is, 
this is about the mechanisms of the institutions that we're in and the funders and the whole whole establishment that perpetuates this will to measure. So from the qualitative comments, these themes came out. So relevance, the, the dominance of journal rankings, the inequities of, of metrics, the ability for them to be manipulated, the fact that they are a quick and dirty way of measuring, alternative metrics as, a, as a, something that adds value, and then the institutional imperatives. So I'll talk a little bit about, you'll see the comments that people have made. So you see here, um, this person is saying that it's really about the publicity rather than the quality of the research in terms of altmetrics. And that if you are um, publishing in a journal that's got a high impact factor, you may absolutely not be reaching the people that actually are going to benefit from the work that you're doing. People valued metrics because they were quantitative. You know, you could actually pin it down. And that some kind of assessment of research is important. Um, and of the, of the measures, this is, you know, metrics are one of the quick methods. And really interestingly, the PBRF, this is one of the reasons people engage with all this, is they've got to put their evidence portfolios together with, with stories and metrics. That PBRF showed that the people that were not necessarily well regarded in their own corridors were actually highly regarded internationally. So that, that was, that's, you know, really positive. Um, However, the sense, um, you know, we'll just carry on from that. So journal rankings. Well, social sciences, and these people came out of more of a management perspective, you know, they don't want to talk about any other journals than really highly ranking journals. However, on the opposite end, from a sciences researcher, it's not about the journal. That quality research needs to be out there to reach people, never mind how well ranked the journal is because if the people that need to see your work are not accessing that journal, it's, it's immaterial. So moving on to um, the way that um, metrics have inbuilt inequities, such as a high a bias towards English language journals, um, and also the fact that H indexes are related to the length of time over five years, for example, and if you've been on parental leave and taken a break, your H index will be lower, but that won't necessarily be taken into account by, by people comparing your work with others. The manipulation factor is present for both alternative metrics and traditional metrics, and that's led to, as many of you will have heard of the um, San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment and also the Leiden Manifesto calling for transparency and, and much more rigour. Um, the, however, alternative metrics, which you know were were, were uh, introduced as precisely an alternative, um, are offering a way of a more holistic view of the work, both within the um, academic discipline and outside. So there's some some good news there. They can help paint a broader picture than that offered by traditional metrics alone. And the institutional imperatives. I think this is really, really telling. People are choosing, if we look at that first comment, having to choose between reaching the people who will benefit from their work, such as local journals, versus getting promotion by publishing in really high, high ranked journals. And here we see that promotion gets turned down if you're not publishing and getting the high citations. And then again, this person, last person's caught within the system, but trying to critique it and using examples of such as my survey. So um, we're going now to talk to researcher profiles. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour about feelings about metrics. So despite one's feelings about measurement and quantification, Sharing one's work with a wide audience is surely a universally desirable feature. When I asked what profiles people held, you can see what they've got here. Um, lots of them had ORCID. Most of, most of them had an institutional profile, meaning the university, and then ResearchGate and Google Scholar. Um, only a third felt that their profiles were a really good reflection of the, their activities. 
So when I asked what ones they preferred, you see again those places they go to get their metrics, the research gate and the Google Scholar. Um, so what people said in terms of which profiles they felt best met their needs. Um, comprehensiveness is a factor. Ease of uploading, sharing, getting the traffic, notifications. Um, and then the sort of formal um, formal offerings of or ORCID and the university profile. So you can see the comprehensive comprehensivity as well as um, authoritativeness offered by ORCID and the university profile. When I asked people what they felt their profiles allowed them to do, I know that, I've, I've shifted that around actually. I think. Uh, so the concerns they had was the time factor involved in making, making these profiles work. Um, copyright was a factor, identifying which was the best gonna help. So there's some questions around how they could use them better. People felt strongly that they increased the visibility of their work, they allowed others to access the collaboration factor, and really interestingly, metrics and citation rates were much lower down in, the, in how many people felt that those profiles allowed them to do that. Um, so going back to my original question, which was what are, what are the faculty perceptions and use of profiles and metrics? We've identified that traditional and alternative metrics can help to indicate academic and societal impact. These people did feel that they did make their work more visible. They weren't quite so um, unanimous in suggesting that the, prof the, the visibility in led to increased citations. So the takeaways for us as librarians is that it's really complicated and there is no magic bullet for, for helping our people use these, these tools. Um, it's very much um, context specific, um, what is real, what's important to them and what's important for their milieu. So I recommend the questions I should have asked just when I started are, you know, what does research impact mean? Do you care? Because someone may not actually care. How do you know when your research has had an impact and what health tools help you to generate that impact and to gather evidence of it? So those are some really useful questions we could start with when we talk to our academics about their profiles and places to gather metrics. Um, so equipped with a deeper understanding of a researcher's position and a discipline specific awareness, we can tailor individualized support. And um, I used the Thompson and French model, which was um, pimping my profile. We've got a nice little researcher profile health check that we're operating now at my university. And of course, getting improved outcomes, getting the work out there to improve outcomes, both for our researchers and also for the people using the research is, is our main game. So um, that's my timer telling me I've reached the end. So that is something that I think is useful for all of us. And I really felt that by the time I'd done this work, I had come full circle and understood what this was really about and therefore could better help the people that I serve. So um, if any of you would like a copy of the research, some of you have it. I um, actually have it out online now in the Vic Research Repository, but just email me and I'm very happy to send you a link. And I'm happy to hear some questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Anne. It's, uh, I think we're extremely lucky to have someone like you who has, has done this research in this field because it is just such a, a relevant topic for all of us. And I was really struck by your comment that an absence of citations does not mean an absence of interest. I don't know about your university, but ours is a little bit obsessed with citations at the moment. So, um, very good reminder. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask Anne? I'll just give you a couple of minutes in case you want to put them in the chat. One thing that I'll just say while you guys are getting, I can see some nice comments. Thanks, everybody. Um, oh, whoopsie. 
I, you know, it took, I've only now at the end of this process, which I finished my report in June, but it took me that long to tidy it up and make it look good. And by that time, the Leanza conference had happened. And only now have I really come full circle in my understanding of what this is all about. And I think one of the struggles for us, which I didn't mention at the beginning, was in our role, we're totally jack of all trades and, and master of none. And we're constantly rushing from one query to another with very thin levels of understanding well that's how I feel I'm four years into this role um, and you know I wouldn't have done this work if it hadn't had a big fat info 580 attached to it um, but it is, has been very valuable and um, I really recommend people read the Leiden Manifesto and Dora they're not big they're not big documents to have a, have a, a sense of what's going on um, and also I came I haven't got it here but it's it's um I'm happy to share it if anyone asks the Federation for Humanities and Social Sciences have come up with a really great definition of impact for those of those fields, which talks about, you know, that much broader, long-term changes in cultural awareness, et cetera. And I actually have wrote um, six top picks for library life. Um, I was asked to do that by Helen Heath, and I've, I've actually put a definition of that by the Art, uh, Federation for Humanities and Social Sciences. So when the next Library Life comes out, unless Helen's edited me too strongly, you'll see that lovely definition, which is far more relevant than this, this very narrow focus. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, we have a question from uh, Nora. Yes, I do think it's helpful for librarians to create um, their own profiles. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it can feel a bit weird if you've got nothing in it, but uh, for, certainly, I've you know, it really does help. So you've got an understanding of what it, how it can behave and what it can look like, and you can have a big fat look on ResearchGate and Academia.edu without having to have a profile. They want you to have one. They want you to sign up, but you can just Google Google a name of a researcher in ResearchGate and have a little look around. I will just um, unshare my computer if, or oh, has someone already stopped me doing that? I think they have. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Anne. I have exciting news. Anna East has entered the bunker. <laughs> so we have some, um, we're having our windows replaced on our, where we are based on level seven of Rank and Brown Building. So we are currently based in a small room on yeah. level one, which I've chosen to call the bunker. And our next presenter, Anna East, is now here. So I'm just going to work out how to share the screen and I will bring up Anna East's presentation and then I will introduce you to her. So just please hold the line. Uh, we'll take a second. Oh, oh. oh I see. Oh, I see. So how do I get it onto slideshow? Oh. Okay, sorry about that. So you should all now be able to see Anna Issa's presentation, and I'm very excited to welcome her here tonight. So Anna East Saisal, who was working at the Victoria University of Wellington Library when she put this presentation together. She is going to talk to us on navigating teaching from face-to-face -to, -face to online library tutorials. So I will get out of her way and welcome Anna East. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So the camera here. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a project I worked on, which was transitioning lectures to um, online face-to-face -face tutorials. Okay. So if this course is mandatory for first years, and it's basically researching a Wellington building or landmark. So I've been conducting a lecture on using the library for SART 151, which is the name of this course. And while the lecture gave relevant information about how to find resources using Index New Zealand, Tiwahawa, 
and the like, I found that students would zone out of the lectures and would be on their phones or their tablets. Okay, so I thought I would try to set up some face-to-face -face workshops where students would learn the skills that I demonstrated in their lecture. So there was a significant increase in engagement with the workshops compared to the lectures and they filled up faster than I could arrange them and I tailored these workshops to align with the specific course assignment so that students would know that when they came in they would find information specific to their assignment and the workshops were held in the library space which would give students a familiarity with the library so here you've got pictures of our library space and so i was doing the tri project the teaching learning research initiative so i'd received casual feedback from students that were very positive about the workshops but i wanted evidence based on student performance in the assignment so the TOI project gave me the opportunity to add an interactivity. And the worksheet I designed were um, on students being able to relate the sources they found to their actual assignment. So here's an example of the exercise. So I got them to find an article, a book, a news item, and a rejected source so something that they would find but they would not use so students that completed the workshop for each source that they found they could then take it away which means they could use it for their assignment the survey the goal is to encourage students to reflect on what they learned and they completed this survey in class. I thought this was important because I thought if I gave it to them and told them to complete it outside of class, I wouldn't get any responses. So students who provided their email address were automatically emailed their survey and they were also asked to use their responses um, to photo research. So here's a website. Um, so this is um, the information that Anne, my, um, the lecturer who was helping me conduct this survey. So just in the benefits of active learning and constructive alignment. So constructing the workshop based on the assignment. And here are some questions we asked. And here are the key themes and some observations that the students made. And here's another question about the source that you rejected, which I thought was important. Here's some so here's another question. So based on how students determined that the information was not of high quality. So the second part of the workshop increased students' confidence in MOA. This was important because this was a part of the assignment where students struggled the most. So you can see that the higher mark for referencing.
So you can see um, students got high marks, especially those who attended both of the workshops. So the library is moving towards an online teaching model. So there was a phased approach in 2019. Students watch the videos are created in the face-to-face -face workshops. And there's also a dedicated space on Blackboard. So here it is. Okay, that's one of the videos, but we haven't got time to show it. But if you would like, I can um, email you these slides. So there were some challenges. It's time consuming and the updates are needed if content changed and there's a learning curve. And but students were very positive. Students preferred face-to-face -face online blend. So here's some information about students access and their suggestions for next year. So a lot of like blended and face-to-face. -face. Lessons learned. Support from your work team is invaluable. Get them to help you. It will make it a lot easier. Create copies of the videos. You don't want to make it and then have not made a copy and you lose all your work. <laughs> Remember, it does not need to be perfect. There are some minor mistakes in my videos. The future. There will be no face-to-face -face tutorials in 2020, but this does not mean face-to-face -face content will end. The lecture visit will continue. And I'll embed the library content into Blackboard. And there'll be 10 to 15 minute consultations in the library space in the week before the assignment is due. But students can also come to me for longer consultations. Advice, embed the teaching, allow time for it to be done in the workshop five minutes breaks. Involve your colleagues. Be aware that the videos take time. Blended learning is the overall results. They prefer that. And here's my email address if people would like to email me. Okay, that went over time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna East, for that. Oh. Is it no stay, 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 okay. stay, stay. <laughs> um, isn't it wonderful how everyone's presentation tonight has in one way or another touched on evidence-based practice? So Joe, I think you have started a, a trend here. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna East. I know you've put a lot of work into that project and into your presentation as well. It's much appreciated. Does anyone have any questions for Anna East? Oh, I'm just going to sit down so I'm not hovering over her shoulder. No, last call. Last call for questions. Me, me, in here. And I, I saw your presentation at Lianza and I really enjoyed it. And I thought, yeah, you got to get those buggers in there right then and there. And, and I really liked how you're meeting them where they are. And there were some other things that you said that, that were really awesome. So I think you've really got the measure of them and, and how to kind of drag them, drag them to the uh, water, which is very good for their health. Um, I can share a video um, by email. Yeah, I have one here, but will probably take a bit too long. We could put it up on the um, yeah. Chelsea Facebook page. Yeah, I did that as well. Good. Okay. Great. Yeah. Also, I'll also add the PowerPoint. Yeah. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna East. You, you are now officially <laughs> off the hook. <laughs>
so I would just like to um, mention a few things um, before we close. So we are we are going to be sending out a survey to all of you, the new. <laughs> um, sorry, we're just we're just reorganising yeah. ourselves in the bunker here. Yeah. <laughs> Hold the line. <laughs> uh, we'll be sending out to all TASIG members a quick survey. We want to find out what what you want from us um, as your new TASIG committee, and also just as importantly, what what you can what you can do to help TASIG. So we are, you know, we're all doing this voluntarily. So if you come up with an amazing idea that we all want to do then i guess our first question for you will be what are you prepared to do to help us make this happen and we won't necessarily expect you to do all of the work but you know many hands make make light work and all that so anyway so keep an eye out for that survey uh, i'd like to wish you all a merry christmas it's been lots of fun bringing people together on these two webinars and getting to know you all just a little bit better and hearing from some of the amazing tertiary librarians who who spoke at Lianza. I'm really looking forward to uh, 2020 and and having lots of exciting TELSIG um, activities and events, whether that's by webinar or whether it's um, around the country. We're just really keen to do what we can to um, to turn this into a great community that, that we're all benefiting from. So that's about all I have to say, I think. Does anybody have any final comments, questions about anything from our presenters or anything to do with TELSIG? I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the format of this. Um, I attended yesterday by Zoom while I was commuting home on the bus. Nice. So I watched it on my phone on the way home and it was just really massively convenient to be able to interact and still comment and things like this. So I thought it was a great initiative by you guys and thanks for thinking of doing it this way. It was very cool. Yeah, thank you. You are welcome. I'd like to say thank you as well. Um, I've just come home on the train and now I'm in my room. Oh, hi, Catherine. <laughs> I'll introduce you to my cat, shall I? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> But I just really want to say thank you for Natalie and Marissa for stepping up and really helping, you know, keeping Tilsig strong and giving it some leadership. I think um, we're in good hands. <laughs> thank you so much, Catherine. I just wanted to ask, so um, one of the things that we talked about was whether or not this is a good time because some of the other Leanza webinars have been at lunchtime, which I know can be tricky. So is the feedback that this is actually a really good time, sort of five to six slot? Well, this is the time that my journal discussion group get together. Mm -hmm. for us. Yeah, and I suppose it's good that we've got a recording as well, so that we know we are, you know, that appeals to a wider audience at their convenience. So that's good. Yeah. Great. Hi. Hi, it's Joe here from I'm at, I'm at you, Cole. And basically, we um, don't have li liaison librarians or anything like that, subject librarians anymore. And our technical staff have had to create in the last 12 months subject guides, learn how to do all that sort of thing. Um, and the help from the other um, universities and polytech libraries has been um, fantastic just being able to access and share that information so thank you guys and thank you for arranging this i know the rest of our team will be looking at this recorded at some stage during the next few weeks so we really appreciate of it and the queen is just going to come into my room so i'll better <laughs> <laughs> go mute again before you hear them but thank you i appreciate what you're doing for us Wonderful, thank you for that. Okay, well, I think I'll just uh, ask Natalie now to to say our uh, karakia whakamutunga. Natalie. Awesome, okay. So, whakanoa e tene wahi, whakanoa e tene kororo, whakanoa e tene tangata, e tene tangata, humie, huie, taikie. Thanks.
Thank you, everyone. Great Thanks, to everybody. see you. Enjoy Bye. your evening. Yeah. <laughs> I had a prepared. I'm not to know.